where we're looking at the life of David on Sunday evenings, mainly in the first book of Samuel. The last time we saw David losing some of his faith and fear got hold of him. And he was on the run from King Saul and he went to the house of God where he told lies to the priests in order to get some help. <clears throat> the priest Ahimelech gave him some of the showbread and Goliath's sword, which David asked for. And amazingly, David then went to the Philistines, to the king of Gath, but his identity was discovered and he was in danger of losing his life. And so he pretended to be mad, scratching at the door and letting his spittle run down his beard. But the Philistines let him go. And according to the first verse of chapter 22, he fled to a place called Adunham, where he sheltered himself in a cave. What tremendous changes David was going through. He had been living in the king's palace, but now he's living in a cave. But then that's often how it is. Through all the changing scenes of life we sing sometimes, and it can be a change for the better, sometimes it can be a change for the worse, and some of God's choicest saints have been in a very low position at times, some have been, even been in prison. Just think of the people in the Old Testament who were in prison who hadn't done anything wrong. Joseph, Jeremiah, Daniel, John the Baptist, Paul, Peter and John. All of them were put in prison for doing good. And the same would be true about a lot of Christians throughout the world today who are in prison for their faith. We should never fall into the trap of thinking that God must have a special love for those Christians who are enjoying good circumstances and he must be annoyed with those other Christians who are enduring bad circumstances. The Bible does not say whom the Lord loveth he rewards, but whom the Lord loveth he chasteneth. David was not the only man of God who found himself living in a cave. You probably know those verses in Hebrews where it states that a lot of men and women of faith lived in the caves of the earth. But David, finding himself in a cave, it turned out to be a blessing for him in the end. He began to realise what a fool he'd been, and this turn, turns him to prayer. In the palace there had been many things to distract his attention away from God, but now he's in a cave with just the basic essentials around him. He turns back to God. It was in the cave of Adullam that David wrote several of his psalms. The first, it would appear, was the 34th psalm. And in that psalm he says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. They're lovely words, aren't they? And these statements show an obvious gratitude to God for his deliverance and safety. But there's also repentance in that psalm and an acknowledgement of his sin, especially the sin of telling lies. For he further says, keep my tongue from evil and my lips from speaking guile. Having realised it was his telling lies that led him now to be in a cave, he wrote those words in the psalm so as to warn others that their lives could also bring them low as well. Psalm 57 and 142 both state at the beginning that they were written by David when he was in this cave. And it speaks in those psalms about how much he cried unto God to help him. <coughs> previously, <coughs> previously he'd sought help from people, like his wife Michal, she did quite a lot for him, and Jonathan, his great friend, and Ahimelech, the priest. But now he's in a cave, he turns to God. And it wasn't until the prodigal son was in the pigsty that we're told that he came to himself, and it wasn't until David was in a cave that he too came to himself. A Christian that has departed from the will of God may, may have to fall very low and be in dire trouble before they will return to the Lord. But let's notice something else here. The nice surroundings of the palace had been no help to David's spiritual life, whereas the unpleasantness of the cave was. You may remember, I'm sure you will, that years later when David was the king and once again living in the palace, he fell into deep sin once more regarding Bathsheba. Uh, 
And in every generation, Christians should be content whatever their state they find themselves in, knowing that earthly improvements may not be conducive to living a spiritual life. Spurgeon said that if only David had prayed as much in the palace as he'd done when he was in the cave, his adultery with Bathsheba and all the consequent misery that brought him and his family into trouble might never have happened. This first verse of this chapter also tells us that David's brothers went to see him in the cave. At this particular time, people had turned against David and the popularity that he once known had gone away. But for those who truly loved him, this was their great opportunity to show it. There's no doubt about it that when you're really down and you find, that's when you find out who your best friends are. Now it is possible that Saul had threatened David's brothers because he wasn't able to get David himself. So the brothers came to David not only to assist him but also to be kept safe by him. And were further told that it wasn't just his brothers <clears throat> but all his father's house went down to join with him. So this would be his relatives, his cousins and so on, amongst whom were Joab and Abishai, men who were going to play a very big part in David's future. In fact, Joab would become the general of his army. All three of his top men, of whom much is said later on, all joined him at this time in the cave. And they were not ashamed to join him when he was at his lowest ebb. And because of this, they were greatly advanced later on when he became king. All this is an obvious picture of our Lord Jesus Christ, the son of David, and of those people who are not ashamed to join him when now on earth his cause seems to be rejected and of little influence. But one day, when every knee shall bow to him as king, they shall be advanced in glory. At the moment the Lord Jesus is despised and rejected of men, but one day he shall appear in all his glory, and those people who have followed him in the days when he was despised will be exalted in those days when he's worshipped by all creation. Verse 2 tells us that a lot of other men who were in trouble came to the cave and they joined themselves to David as well. Altogether there were 400 of these people, quite a large number, but only a few compared to Saul's army. What's interesting is that verse 2 describes these people who came to David as the three Ds. Those in distress, those in debt, and those who were discontent. Discontent with their lot under King Saul and discontent with the way he was running the country. It wasn't the noble people or the clever people or the well-off people who came to David. It was those who had trouble and wanted help. Wasn't that the same in the Gospels? with the people who came seeking the Lord. In the main, they were poor and needy people, those who were lepers, those who were sick, those who were blind, those who were lame, and so on. And so it will always be that those who come to Christ are mainly the nobodies of this world, people who realise how much they need our Lord's help. Quite a few people who turn to Christ have been discontent, discontent with the world which has left them feeling empty. They're also in distress about their sin. They realise that they treated the Lord badly. They also realise that they're in debt to God. They've taken so much from him and given him nothing back. Notice also that it says here that David became captain over these people. And so it must be with those who come to Christ. He's not only their saviour, but he comes the captain over their lives. But by accepting David as their captain, this would mean that these men would have Saul out to kill them. So again with the Christian, because the world despises our captain, we shouldn't be surprised if it also despises those who accept him as their captain. Now not only were David's brothers at risk because of Saul's hatred, but also his mother and his father. And needless to say, Jesse and his wife, had done no wrong to Saul. But as far as David was concerned, Saul's hatred knew no bounds. And if he couldn't get David, then he might get his parents instead. So they too had to leave their homes over this business, and there was nowhere else for them to stay in Israel. 
Perhaps it was possible that Saul might have arrested David's parents and held them as hostages and threatened to kill them if David didn't give himself up. And that goes on today in various countries which are ruled over by tyrants. Now David did not want his parents to enjoy the same hardship as he himself was undergoing. And so he seeks for some place for them to stay temporarily so that they would be safe. Even at a time of great personal trouble, David honours his mother and father, and again how like our Saviour, for at the height of his own personal trouble when he was on the cross, he sought a safe refuge for his mother with the disciple John. We're then told in verse 3 that David negotiated with the king of Moab to allow his parents to come to that land for protection. For you see, David had a, uh, Jesse had a connection with the land of Moab, for his grandmother was Ruth, as we saw in that reading, and she had been a Moabitess. Ruth had married Boaz and had a son called Obed, and he was the father of Jesse. Ruth's sister-in-law, Orpah, had remained in Moab, and it's quite possible that her descendants would have had respect for David's parents. So isn't this a wonderful case where one book of scripture confirms another? Had we not had the book of Ruth, we wouldn't have known why David went to the Moabites to get help for his parents. It shows again that all scripture fits together. It also shows that sons and daughters should be concerned for their aging parents even if their own situation is tough. You see, David could have said, well, I'd love to help my mother and father, but I'm in a very difficult position myself. Isn't this the cry that goes up from many ungodly sons and daughters as to why they neglect their parents? David could not look after his parents himself. That was impossible in the cave, but he made arrangements for other people to do so for him. And so David brought his parents to the king of Moab and asked them to look after them until the day when his own situation would become more clear. But it's good to see how he witnesses to the Lord here, for he says to this heathen king at the end of, verse, uh, at the end of this verse, until I know what God will do for me. His hope is in the Lord. He realises that God is sovereign, and it's up to him what's going to happen to him, and not Saul. See how much his faith had been restored by now. He was later to write in Psalm 27, When my mother and father forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. His mother and father couldn't help him anymore, but God could and would. But aren't, those, aren't they lovely words here, which all those who live by faith should use, especially in a time of trouble. I will wait until I know what God will do for me. It's rather like what Naomi said to Ruth, and we read it together, when she was anxious about marrying Boaz, whether he'd marry her or not, and she said, sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. Don't be action, anxious, just be patient, and leave it for God to sort things out on your behalf. It's not easy to reach that position, but once you have, it's a wonderful experience because you're allowing the peace of God to rule in your heart. And it means that you've completely resigned yourself over to God's will. And you're saying to him, Lord, I leave my future entirely in your hands. Whether you want it to go well with me or tough with me, I just want to live under your smile. I want to know that it's well with my soul and that you'll work all things together for my good. It's all summed up in that lovely hymn, O oh Lord, how happy should we be if we could cast our care on thee, if we from self could rest and feel at heart that one above in perfect wisdom, perfect love is working for our best. But sadly, most of us find ourselves in the second verse of that hymn, how far from this our daily life, ever disturbed by anxious strife, by sudden wild alarms. Or could we but relinquish all our earthly props and simply fall on thine almighty arms? Can you see that little word for at the end of verse 3? What God would do for me. David didn't know what was going to happen to him, but he had the faith to believe that God would work for him and not against him. 
I hope we've got that sort of faith where we honestly believe that God is working for us when we're facing big trouble. Anyway, David left his parents with the king of Moab and were told that they dwelt with him all the time that he was in the hole or in the cave. And there in the cave, David stayed for some time waiting for God to guide him. And this is what happened. For God sent a prophet to him called Gad. Now Gad was probably one of the young prophets in Samuel's school. You know, the sons of the prophets, Samuel was helping them. So one of these young men was Gad and he became chaplain to David and Gad would pray for David and his cause and instruct him in the ways of God. Later, a priest was going to join David along with this prophet. In verse 5, Gad, speaking from the Lord, tells David that it's time now for him to leave the cave and go back to the land of Judah. This might have seemed a bit foolish because he was going to put himself back in the place of danger because he'd now be where Saul was again. So it was a direction calculated to test David's faith and make him display his confidence in the Lord. Previously, he'd failed this sort of test because instead of trusting in the Lord with all his heart, he'd lean to his own understanding and he'd run away to the land of the Philistines. But now he must be brave and act by faith on God's words through the prophet. He must remember that he'd been anointed to be the next king and therefore no harm could come to him. He's got faith to believe what God said. You see, it's rather the same with Christians today. If they live in the centre of God's will, no harm can possibly come to them. But it needs faith to believe that. And a lot of those who are lacking in faith prefer to hide themselves away in the modern caves. It, they prefer to live in what seems to be the safest place instead of what seems to be the right place. So there's a third illustration from the book of Ruth. For when a shortage of bread came to Bethlehem, Ahimelech and his wife Naomi left that place which was best for their souls, Bethlehem, and went to live in the land of Moab, where they thought their family would be more safe, and yet as it turned out, three quarters of their family died in what seemed to be the safest place. Anyway, we're told that David obeyed the word of the Lord and returned to the land of Judah and stayed in a forest called Harith. So now his situation would be rather like Robin Hood and his merry men living in a forest. Meanwhile, Saul was getting worse and worse and he'd set aside all other concerns in order to murder David. And verse 6 tells us that he heard that David was now surrounding himself with a band of men and he returned to Judah. So Saul calls his servants together under a big tree so as to discuss what they should now do about this situation. No longer was it the Philistines that Saul looked upon as his enemies, it was David. And we're told that he sat with a spear in his hand, which indicated his bloodthirsty intentions. There had been a time when he'd fought against God's enemies, but now he was fighting against God's friends. Isn't it sad when you see the same sort of thing happening today? Somebody who used to be a, in the Christian church, apparently fighting against evil, and now they change sides and seem to be fighting against good. Saul got to hear where David was, and was beginning to think that David was plotting against him. Why did he bring all these men with him? Well, he's going to make an attack on me. But nothing could be further from the truth. David had never ever used any of his forces to attack Saul. He always knew that it would be wrong because Saul was the Lord's anointed. By what he says in verse 7 and 8, Saul seems to be going slightly mad. He's utterly consumed with this business about David and it makes him think that he can't trust anybody at all. Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin and we're told that most of his servants were from that tribe. So it seems as though he believed in jobs for the boys. He seems to have been a man with favourites and he'd given gifts and lands and positions to his friends. David, on the other hand, was from the tribe of Judah. So Saul tries to get his servants to believe that if they had David as a king, he wouldn't help them. They couldn't get any favours from him. 
He's developing what is known as a persecution mania. Terrible thing. And he starts to blame his servants and everybody else for his downfall. He said that they had conspired against him and that they had no concern for his plight. He even says that his own son Jonathan was their ringleader just because he wouldn't kill his best friend. David and Jonathan had made a covenant of friendship. They never thought of ever trying to do anything against Saul. Never were they thinking about taking his throne. But it's always sad to see a person with so much self-pity that they think that everybody is against them and that nothing ever seems to go their way. In this business of Saul and David, the facts were that Saul was always trying to kill David. But he turns it the other way round so as to cover up the evil that he's doing and he's making out that David is seeking to kill him. He actually says in verse 8, none of you are sorry for me. None of you are sorry for me. Oh, how many people there are who feel like this when they're low, that nobody cares about them, nobody is sorry about their situation. And certainly loneliness can be a terrible thing and most people desire friendship and nobody wants to be in a situation where they're on their own with nobody to call upon for companionship. But that's what happens to some people and they're driven nearly mad because they've got nobody to talk to. It is true, of course, that sometimes it can be a person's own fault for as the old saying goes, if you want friends, you've got to be friendly. You've got to put yourself out and do the things that the other person likes doing and not just those things that you like doing. But the worst thing is when somebody imagines that everybody's against them when they're not. And this scripture shows us that a person can feel this way no matter higher position they hold. Saul is the king. And nobody's against him at all. He just imagined it. And yet this has been true of lots of people. The devil is always trying to get them down by telling them that others are against them. In fact, the person that you feel dislikes you may well feel that you dislike them and they'd like nothing better than to be good friends with you. Now you may remember that this sort of thing had happened to Saul before, in his early days before he became the king. He was worried then because he thought that his father's asses were lost. And Samuel had to say to him, As for the asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them, for they are found. He was worrying about a non-existent problem. He always seemed to be a man who thought the worst when things were much better for him than, they, than he realised. How very different things could have been for Saul if he had loved God and sought his help and been more sensible. For the two people who was, he was so much against, David and Jonathan, could have been his very best friends. They'd have done all sorts of things for him. Both David and Jonathan had distinguished themselves as great warriors. David up against Goliath, acting in great faith and courage. And Jonathan had done the same, if you remember, with his armour bearer against 20 Philistines that they'd slain. David and Jonathan both loved God and would also have loved Saul if it hadn't been that he was so bitter against them. So here is one of the sad things of life that even when people are given special friends and special advantages, because they've got a bad attitude and suspect the worst about people, those advantages don't do them any good. And they can finish up very miserable people. So these eight verses in our passage that we looked at this evening show us that a change for a better in David and a change for the worse in Saul. They also show us once more the important truth that it's not your outward circumstances that are the main thing in life, it's your attitude to life and how you feel within that's most important. Saul was king, but he felt that he hadn't got a friend in the world. Whereas David was in a cave and then in a forest, but he was restored to his faith and he enjoyed fellowship with the Lord again. And so it is today that the Christian who is close to Christ and finds that the best friend to have is Jesus, 
will enjoy their life far more even if their outward circumstances are tougher than the prosperous person who's a stranger to God and still in their sins. But isn't it encouraging that whereas last week we saw David backsliding, losing some of his faith, telling lies, this week we see him being restored into the man of God that he was. And this can be true for Christians today. There's not only forgiveness with God, there's complete restoration. The father of the prodigal son not only forgave his boy, he laid on great celebrations for him. And if a Christian who's drifted away from the Lord comes to their senses and returns to him with all their heart, God will not only forgive them, but surround them with all his love and grant them his continual presence again. Well, where does that leave us tonight? Is Christ our captain? Will we stand up for him when he's little esteemed and be rewarded for it later on when he reigns supreme? May the Lord impress upon us where each of us stand. Amen.